You ever get that humanity doesn't really care feeling? I have a great curiosity. I have a great curiosity as to how things work. I'm, uh, the medical book that I'm reading is going into very, well, not supremely, uh, but very detailed descriptions of the neurochemistry, you know, in the brain and our capacity, our brain's capacity to sedate us, to render parts of our whole mind unconscious. Here it becomes really essential to uh, explain one kind of view of what and who we call ourselves as one part what we're aware of in say the cortex right I'm not a brain expert but you you know the higher development of the brain and a lot of things that determine our behavior, determine how we see, what we see, what we say, what we don't say, what we hear, what we don't hear, how we think, how we view anything and everything in parts of our brain that we have little to no access to, that have become involuntary and that dictate a lot of our lives and that take their genesis in large part in experiences of the total organism in the womb and after of pain beyond and before words. So these are things on par with heroin that the body has receptors for, which is why we can take heroin, to have a chemical component to losing ourselves to a part of ourselves that will come to dictate our lives beyond all comprehension or notice or any change really in the, in the state of affairs of how the brain is working and you can't be conscious of what you're unconscious of by definition this is where we get into a much more philosophical I think philosophical area of how are human beings how should we expect human beings to behave do they behave because that's just the way a human being will invariably be born, to behave a certain way. Do they behave a certain way because they're treated a certain way? And are people treated a certain way um, more likely to subject an infant or even uh, a fetal child to an environment that will provoke this type of neurochemistry? So we, we carry around the, be, the be, behavioral evidence of trauma-based unconsciousness that is fully represented by the brain's capacity to render itself unconscious, or at least to uh, prevent with a sort of gating system information about our lives critical to our, the development of our brains and of taking the greatest advantage of our relationship to our whole environment and all that that means gates that prevent that information from ever coming into our experience and that what we call our experience is in itself very much determined by compulsions, imperatives that exist 
far below our capacity to access them. And we're not talking about some collective unconscious and just, we're talking about injuries. It's then another question to say, well, is life just difficult that these injuries are going to take place? Does an organism need to render itself into some kind of highly functional stupor in order to live? How do you make the case for that being perfectly natural? And if you can't, you have not the only reason to attempt to mitigate for this. If you're someone who's curious and wants to know about the world, wants to know as much as possible, at least to know as much as possible what you don't know, enough that you're not going to put too much stake in things that may be not as necessarily true as you'd like them to be. Then, this is where I, I'm inclined to talk about the family temple, the church inside of us, what we connect to. Now, this only makes sense if you would like to consider the kind of responsibility that you might have to what you connect to inside yourself. Um, to be able to entertain the very real possibility that your brain has been forced to disconnect from much of which constitutes the totality of our self, that which we are responsible for, even if it dictates our behavior beyond our control. Because it's ours. It's in us. Of course, paradox is abound. And this is precisely the kind of territory where people tend to skew off in very, very divergent ways. But you don't need religion to do this. But when you're connecting to yourself, you're connecting to processes that affect you and in every intimate part of your life and everyone's life around you and all the types of connections that you have, don't have, enjoy and suffer over hundreds of years. Chemicals. Chemical receptors. Chemical dynamics things that stimulate, uh, things that receive. You can, your, your brain never develops a tolerance to its own pharmacopoeia. So it's handing out blessings. Blessed unconsciousness, blessed oblivion is being handed out by our brains before we're even born. And this, what Dr. Arthur Janov calls dislocated functioning, because you're not going to get the proper levels of communication between all areas of the brain. And, uh, this has an effect and has been shown to have a wide variety of effects on all the systems, from may not, maybe not genes, but how those genes are or are not going to express themselves, sex hormones, sexual orientation, personality, drive, depression, compulsion, psychosis, hallucinations, religious beliefs, how we manage stress. We're talking about billions of human systems that are beyond their notice or awareness on chemical and neurochemical high alert from the moment they're born. High alert as in fright, stay put, don't do anything, don't look, don't talk, don't listen and flight. Do anything and everything you can. Don't talk, don't listen. So we're getting to a very clinical medical support for all the videos that I've made. This is why I don't read fiction. Because truth is better than any fiction and as a writer I actually like to have more control of my world than just letting someone paint it for me I've lost my taste for that because the more 
sensible I've become of my environment, I don't like to call being more aware because I don't think that I could give any evidence that I'm more aware than anyone. Uh, more aware than I was when I was five. I, I don't know what that would mean. Um, because my total organism is always aware of everything that any organism needs to be aware of. Right? Isn't that a fair comment? Right? So to say that I, someone becomes more aware is actually dehumanizing. Right? If you're, if you're doing anything, you're getting less aware. <laughs> okay? Right? And not even by your totality, just this little part of yourself you think is you or all of you. You think you know yourself, and then maybe you meet a girl or a guy that you really like. Boy, you start feeling lots of different things. You start maybe even being doing things you wouldn't normally do, right? Who hasn't watched a child's behavior completely change when they're in love? Hell, I spent my life growing up with psychopaths. Their behavior would change a fucking drop out of a penny. A lot of implications to what we're talking about here. Now, if you're okay being responsible for yourself, the truth is better than any fiction, but it forces you to have a lot more control of your life. Because all of a sudden you're responsible not just for what you do, but for everything that's ever been done to you. And all that your organism has done to respond to that and to protect you from the pain even if it creates more pain in your life and reduces uh, the number of options you have to live and to connect to life. So most people to connect to life have to connect to what's happened to their life at a neurochemical level. I don't mean like you know all the chemicals involved, but I, to have some appreciation that there's a neurochemical component to everything we see as reality. And a lot of that at its the core basis of how our own minds function, the things we rely upon for everything, have disconnected from reality as much as any drug addict on the street and according to drugs that we never develop a tolerance for that's interesting that's more interesting than any fictional book to me and uh, you know and I'd like to think someone could actually be quite sensible of that as I have been without seeing the clinical and medical support for it that's important it's important not just for me, I think it's important to say that about human intelligence. I think most people are pretty fucking aware of what they like and what they don't like, and that on some level, in terms of their total mind, to what, it, what a total organism is aware of, of stresses they would rather not have that prevent us from relaxing. You need to be able to get down. You need to be able to get up. <laughs> you need to be able to perform. You need to be able to rest, wait, and just pay attention. Watch in the course of a day. I'm not picking on the viewer. I mean anyone, right? Any of us. Watch in the course of a day, course of a week, course of a month. Anything that raises your heart rate when you're dealing with people or your feelings or the world around you, anything that elevates your heart rate, someone could cut you off in traffic. Right? Think of the chemicals being produced. Think of what would happen if your brain released a flood of all the information and all the energy and all the, the physical response in your body to being deprived of oxygen or dignity as a, as a child as a fetus and every time that happened because what happens in the womb Dr. Janoff has pointed out and I think quite correctly I agree is recap recapitulated by the environment of a child big surprise right that the womb of a mother is just is the environment that you'll be born into it's a different version of the same thing through a glass darkly. Maybe you've taken a few glasses away. Boom. Hey, I recognize this. And your body is already neurochemically prepared to disconnect in certain ways so that you can get along with that environment. Lo and behold, the organism is preparing to be accepted by the world it's going to be totally dependent upon. That's pretty smart. So anyone who has any mental problems in the world, even all the psychopaths, we have to acknowledge that what their brain has done is exactly what you'd want an intelligent organism to do given the environment that 
they were subjected to in the womb. What does that tell you? And they and we are still completely responsible for everything we do and say. That's the fuck of it. Right? By the time a child is born, their lives are already going to be dictated by everything that, that they have endured in the womb. And they're completely responsible for that. And they have to be. Because if we take that away from them, we're really taking away the last shred of dignity that they have. So your mind is yours to explore. I've always liked that. I just finished telling some people. I have no trouble telling people. You know, I've gone in and out of several cults in my life. I get a lot out of it. People are always taken back. I love seeing how people respond to certain pat statements like that, you know. I've probably been in and out of dozens of cults in my life. I'm still getting out of the cult of my family. It's hard to get out of the cult of your own family if you respect what a family and what a cult can, can really be about. Because because you're always relating to your birth mother and father, whether you like it or not, whether you like them or not. Right? That's our first connection. So the language of connection and the language of life is built in the womb between you, your mother, and your father. And anyone else is there, right? It's people that your mother and father have let be there by their authority and by your authority. So everything is actually articulated, everything is represented by your mother and father and you. Whatever happens to you, some doctor, you know, sticks a needle in you, goes a little too far. Now remember, the pain, some people have said that a child's pain is not as much as the mother's. It's actually many times more. And they've shown that chemically. I don't know if it's five or 50 times more in the womb. And that child's completely helpless, knows nothing, boom, you're... I think because our brains are so unconscious and been rendered like in a drug hate and drug-like stupor at such a deep level that we are not inclined to appreciate how much pain other beings might suffer because we're not even aware how much pain we're suffering. So impression becomes propensity. Injury becomes propensity. In here, in this mess, in this rat's nest of what I'm talking about, you can start to pick some of the letters of our native genius out of it and start to make your own decisions, right? Is evolution completely true? Uh, Dr. Arthur Janoff makes the case, you know, obviously, in terms of evolution, life is meant to be cruel. The brain obviously adapted ways of dealing with pain so that it could support the development of the higher cortex because that there was survival advantage in being able to think about shit. Right? To, to maybe make deductions and predictions about one's environment and from one's environment. That, that sounds sensible. I, that, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that is a completely working and useful way of looking at the world. But I don't agree that it's necessarily the most explicitly true story about the origin of our brains. And my biggest objection, just on a philosophical basis, is that as with Christianity and the idea that you're born in sin, there's the mark uh, there's the artifact of this tendency I think we have um, to say that it necessarily follows from the fact that we seem to have endured lots of pain uh, in our bodies and in our minds and that we're very good at responding to it in our bodies and our minds that this is something that is to be expected by our biggest visions of life and human origins. I find that dehumanizing. And to me, it, I mean, it's very demonstrative. It's true, like beliefs are true, especially beliefs that take their genesis in, yeah, I, an unmitigated torture. Why wouldn't someone who's been tortured think that life was about torture? But by his own admission, none of our brains are operating correctly. You can't have, you can't have your whole cake here. Life is supposed to be suffering, the brain is good at dealing with it, but it doesn't maintain full functioning. You're sacrificing function for pain relief, just like with any drug, right? You don't take heroin and think you're going to function fully. You don't drink a couple bottles of wine and think you're going to function, but it has another kind of function that just 
means you don't have other kinds of function. You don't have whole function. And if, in entertaining this line of thinking, you feel a bit suspicious, you should, that if everyone thought this way all the time, wouldn't it be hard to trust other people, given the brains they're carrying around? Well, I would argue that if this is all true, um, and right now I believe that it is, it matches my observations and many, many years of my own writing, I don't, but I don't have to say anything's necessarily true. I, I don't care. I'd rather commend people to their intelligence. Um, you can deduce from this what you will. Of course, the literature is there for you to read yourself, and this book here is called Why You Get Sick and How You Get Well by Dr. Arthur Shanoff. So I don't mind uh, citing that. Um, is that I think people are sensible of it already. Take this to be true. People are obviously living in it, so the paradox is is you know, whatever your body has rendered you ignorant of, by necessity, that has its value. But it doesn't necessarily follow from that that there's no value in becoming more aware of the environment, that we understand the ways that we do, as much if not more because of how it has hurt and neglected us than because of how it has given some particular advantage to us. And this is our mother and father. Because think, as an example, Think about a world where millions of people watch a couple of infants bicker and fight over, quote-unquote, their healthcare system or something to do with their financial security, security of their person, their property, their freedom to travel, which affects every system's sense of being nourished. It affects your cardiovascular system, what you trust, how you love feeling safe, which affects everything. Right, so if you live in America, in the United States, you're watching a couple of infants bicker over this president to president, you know, congressman to took, the whole thing, right? And you'll hear yourself in the background of your mind saying, as these two infants fight over the rattle of your life, I hope you two know what you're doing. Can you believe that? What does that make us? Right? That gives you a quick picture of what's happened to our mind. Just by looking at effects, not by looking at intentions and some great conspiracy, although they clearly exist to some degree. If, if, you, want to, if you want to impute some intelligence and coordination to the unfolding of the spectacular display of glorified human torture we call the modern world, um, you can just look at the natural intelligence of people who share an incredible thirst for maintaining the kind of stupor they've been forced to enjoy in order to survive the very world that would render them so unconscious in the first place. And indeed, an incredible world, an incredible inner church and universe that would provide the chemical basis for that happening without them having to really do anything about it at all. So by the time they reach for another drug, you know, they're just, they're just supplementing the, uh, the, uh, the kingdom of drugs inside their own brain, their own church. And surely it's not the first time you've heard a comparison between the sacred and the functioning of the human brain. And I would argue, although a lot of this architecture goes on pre-verbal, at minds deeper than that which we maybe normally think of as being language-oriented and also before we form speech, before we can even scream out loud. Mm -hmm. Right, so how do you feel being in a little box filled with water? You love it, but when things go bad, you can't fucking do anything about it. How do you think that relates to how we relate to the world? And again, another way of looking at evidence of brain damage. What evident diminished capacity do we have to answer to the demands of our own basic self-preservation. How often do, do we drop the ball on that? Now, there's all different ways of dealing with human survival. There's a guy that might train himself to fucking build his own house and hew his own lumber and build his own... That's full-on top-shelf survival, right? Well, highly valued. But any way that the brain 
can gain some clearer relationship with the environment as it is and what it might actually tell us the more access we have to every memory stored in our brain, painful or otherwise, that and anything that does that is top tier survival. It's a time well spent, right? Whether you get paid for it or not. So I'm arguing for thinking about things, daring to feel and experience the world as it is because you already have um, at your leisure. Huge subject in itself. Um, and using your words because our ancestors equated the intelligence of our ability to speak to express which means also to gain the full value of our lives at every level pre-verbal or not so there's lots of things in words that aren't necessarily words so words aren't necessarily totally exclusive to all the dimensions, forces, and experiences we have, whether or not we have the words for them. And whether or not you want to use words to describe them. You have words as an option, but you needn't solely rely upon them. Because everything, even if it's not made up of words, speaks volumes. Why? Because we, we, we use this term, speaking, and words, but what we're really talking about is communication, which means the communication of life and energy and information. And everything is doing that all the time. We're living in words, most of which we will never spell or dissemble in any other way or perhaps don't even need to than just breathing, living, experiencing the ingress of one moment to the next, one season to the next. Human beings are so into control. We lay down pavement, we got everything under control. But our relationship with nature really doesn't bear that out, whether or not you're anti-society or not. You can't apply the way we relate physically to our environment in terms of social control and environmental control, which has its advantages, and say that that is our relationship. That's the same level of control that we have, strictly speaking, with our own minds, with our own internal dynamics. We don't really have that. Quite the opposite. And as much as the world looks free and we have freedom, we know it's dictated by a lot of martial, religious, scientific, and evil forces, let's say. Well, so is our own mind. If, how, how much trouble do you have getting people to be conscious of gross deceptions and self-deceptions, really? Because the greatest deceptions of the world are always self-deceptions. You say, oh, that guy lied to me. Or that, why did you think he would tell the truth? You lied to yourself. You said, I can expect this man is telling the truth. Fuck off, you can expect this man is telling the truth. But one of the... One of the things that are rarely mentioned about the benefits of martial systems and military orders and religion, which all go together, and fertility cults, which all go together, and I think the pride parades and stuff every year, they're a very warped fertility cult which is what all the ones that come down to us in the modern era really are, right? Which is weird, a fertility cult called the Pride Parade that has very little to do with pride and is basically celebrating people who have lost the ability for sexual reproduction. Now, think what you will, that's a fact. I mean, you look at religions, because I think the gay, LGBTQ gay pride thing with, the, with its rainbow is a new religion. It satisfies the definition of a religion. And if for no other reason, how much it is accepted and pushed with no critical objection by anyone. As though, again, we've taken a segment of society and saying, because you're gay, masses of you will create more sanity in the world. You, you, you have, you, you're more human, you're healthier. What? You somehow haven't sustained any egregious um, eccent eccentricities in your endocrine system. You know, you should be singled out. No one should think about your sex hormones being out of balance precisely because you've lost the ability to sexually reproduce. So this idea of creating new criteria for what is a normal or healthy human being is something in itself you should be fucking very, very suspicious of. It doesn't matter if there's some intent or conspiracy behind it. We just do stupid shit. And no one can deny the fact that it feels good, that beliefs serve an opiate-like function and what the, the case that's being made here is that there is a neurochemical and even natal basis for that 
that necessarily stays beyond our comprehension. Because its genesis lay in protecting us from ever being aware of the circumstances attending its genesis, which is fucking painful and challenges the capacity of what we call our conscious mind to deal with it. And still, guess what? Do what, that, what our body tries to, to make our conscious mind do, which is be aware so that it can function and move forward, even in an overwhelming situation. You know, don't have time to fucking dwell. You know how many times I've talked to alcoholics and psychopaths who don't have time to think or talk about certain things? Not the right time. It'll never be the right time. It's never going to be the right time for society to really examine itself. It's all cults. It's never going to be the right time. You can make time. Society's never... Are you fucking kidding me? The sun would sooner fucking go backwards and, and go back into the dawn an hour later. It's not going to happen neurochemically, physically. That's not going to happen. Society is the unexamined life. That's what society is. It doesn't examine itself. It's fucking institutions are the worst thing for examining itself. They're the most biased. They're the most religious. They're the most conditioned people. You know, this, this assumption, of course, you can go to some form of education or martial conditioning and come out with some, what, better idea of a, some more comprehensive idea of human life? Fuck off. But the fact that you think that is not a sign of its failure. It's a sign of its success in terms of the actual parameters, the actual demands of the whole mind of man, given what man has actually experienced in his tissues, his, his environment as corroborated by all of the conventions and the perception and the brain function and lack of function, an equation of lack of function with superior function that we live in like a new amniotic fluid. So, yeah, the pride stuff is a, is a new religion. I forget what I started off saying. So the world looks at like its advantage, but we know that there's a government that's actually taking a lot from people in order to uh, groom um, it, make the world easier, or people are more satisfied with less. Right? As a child, I grew up with a lot of neglect. You got used to it. The brain automatically gets used to it. And we're kept at that infant level of neurochemistry. Right? There, are, there are, no doubt, chemists... Right? Egypt actually came from a word for divine science, chem, chemi, so alchemy, chemi. This has to do with neurochemistry, celestial biology. It's all chemicals, right? What we're eating, what we're breathing, how we see. You don't think how we see our brain function is of some interest to the natural world. It's, that's, that's all we're fucking made of. That's, that's matter. That's all the matter of it all. It's the matter with everything. It's the mind of everything. You want to govern that mind. Right? And a, govern, a governor in an engine doesn't just control for the sake of control. It controls because it needs the resource of what it's controlling. Keep the engine going. Keep the fuel going where it's supposed to go. Keep the, keep the arteries moving. Okay. You know in Vancouver they started to call for people not to be outside. What? Oh, oh, yeah. because of the, yeah. Because of the smoke. Oh, yeah. It's getting pretty bad. I haven't. Fortunately, it doesn't affect my breathing, but it's it is getting in me for sure. Yeah. No, you can start. You're starting to smell in there now. Oh yeah. But yeah, I don't. That's crazy. I know. Hey, good. How are you? Apparently, yeah, it's out of water. Oh. Even though it's still trying to run. Oh, cool.
girls don't understand that. What are about the grape juice? Oh. Yeah, I didn't know why it stopped, yeah. Yeah, it's just out of water. You know, it's the more you know. You don't can't know everything. But I, it's always a good idea, I think, to familiarize yourself with the language of your life. the government offers um, certain benefits that conceal the actual costs and need to conceal the actual profits from our compliance, indeed the wealth of our native industry, much less any critical scrutiny of what it's devoted to and how much at what cost, yada yada. So do our bodies regulate what we know about ourselves or the genesis of what advantage we take in feeling as well as we do and how we do precisely because of how much our whole mind has actually suffered beyond all subsequent so even science itself, I should read Dr. Janoff, I mean, hasn't been putting two and two together for a long time. 